Happy Draft Week, everybody. We're right here giving you our final mock draft of draft season. And again, this is what Steve Palazzolo, our lead draft analyst, would do with all the picks if he were the GM. We're not trying to guess who the picks are actually going to be. This is, if we're the GM for every single team, this is what we would do. And we'll kick it off at number one with the Cleveland Browns going with quarterback Baker Mayfield. Really no surprise here if you've been following us. Yeah, I've been putting Baker Mayfield at number one pretty much the entire time. He's the number one QB on our board. And look, I don't know if this is going to happen on draft night. As we said, we're not necessarily trying to predict, but our top QB in the right areas, he's number one on our draft board, and we're saying, look, if we're the Cleveland Browns, this is the guy we take. Yeah, he's the number one QB on our board. Browns need a quarterback. Really not, really not too much of a debate here. I like the pick. Number two, New York Giants going USC quarterback Sam Darnold. Another pick that's pretty much stayed the same over the last few months. Uh, with Darnold, you know, the debate in New York is do you need to get a quarterback? Are they going to go with Barkley? There's no way I would even consider a running back at two. I know you agree. Yeah, there's not even just a running back, anything other than a quarterback if I'm right. the New York Giants at this point because Eli Manning, 37 years old, that roster not close to competing for a Super Bowl this year, maybe not even next year. Get a quarterback of the future in there. You're not going to be picking top five every year. You're not going to have a shot at a guy every year. This makes just way too much sense. If they don't go a quarterback on draft day, I will be – Floored. Yeah, so that's pretty much my reasoning on the whole thing, too. You have to go quarterback. Darnold is the number two QB on our board. And, man, his high-end play is just so good. I can really see a, a very good NFL career for him. Reminds me a lot of Phillip Rivers. Yeah. All right, on to number three, New York Jets taking UCLA quarterback Josh Rosen. So it's a similar story with the Jets. They need a quarterback. You know, they have Josh McCown and Teddy Bridgewater in as bridge-type quarterbacks. The Jets moved up to get a QB. I do think that there's three quarterbacks worth getting in that top three, and, and Rosen's the number three guy. And I don't think that's, uh, you know, he's not, I don't have him as high as Darnold or Baker. He's number three on our draft board, but still a guy you're capable of winning games with because he can make the high level NFL throws. Just has to cut back on some of those bad decisions. Yeah, Jets, very much like the Browns, they are going to go quarterback. They traded up to number three so that they can find a quarterback because they believe, like we do, that there are three quarterbacks in this draft that are going to be franchise guys. So at least you're at number three. You'll get your pick of one. You might not get your first choice, but Josh Rosen, fairly good consolation prize. If they get him on draft day, I'd be pretty happy if I were them. On to number four, Cleveland Browns on the clock again. We give them our top non-quarterback in this draft, Maurice Hurst, defensive tackle, Michigan. Yeah, so this is one of those guys that uh, everybody was trashing my last mock, you know, because everybody's saying, why is Maurice Hurst going number four? But again, the point is this is what we would do. This is our best non-quarterback. You already got your QB in Baker Mayfield. If you add Maurice Hurst, who's the best interior penetrator in this draft by a wide margin, hmm. add him to that defensive line right next to Larry Ogunjobi, who's a good run stopper, and of course, last year's number one pick, Miles Garrett. Now you're building that D line that you need to, uh, you know, just to make an impact for the Browns de uh, on their defense. I really like Maurice Hurst going there if I'm the Browns because you impact defensive linemen. One, in this class, there aren't that many. There aren't a lot of high-end, talented defensive linemen. And the thing is, they do, when they do go in the draft, they go quickly. You can't find a lot of impact guys along that D-line in the third round, fourth round, whereas other positions there, you might be able to. So if I'm then the Browns at four, you got to go premium position. you got to go either D-tackle, corner, something like that. Some guy's going to make an impact right away. So Maurice Hurst definitely fits that bill for us there. On to number five, Denver Broncos selecting Notre Dame guard Quinton Nelson. So we moved Nelson up our board a little, you know, just last week. Our final draft board is out there. We moved him up. I know everybody loves him. We're calling him the best, probably the best pure player in the draft. But when you add positional value, it drops him down a little bit. But he is that good at guard, right? If he could have this Marshall Yonda type of career, Yonda being a top three guard pretty much every year of his career, mm -hmm. I think that's worth it at that point. And so if he can be a Hall of Famer... He, he's worth it at top five. No, yeah. I'm but you think he's a Hall <laughs> no, of Famer. I, agree. I know you love I him. Yeah. So if he's a Hall of Famer, yeah, it's worth the number yeah. five pick. Here's where Denver is in my mind, though. We talked about three quarterbacks being available. I think in the reality, on draft night, if Josh Allen is one of those top few picks, hmm. that drops one of our quarterbacks, one of our top three quarterbacks, whether it's Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold, or Josh Rosen, that puts those guys in play for Denver. Hmm. If one of those guys are in play, I think you – you grab those guys, right? Make a leap, but they're yeah. off the board in this in this particular draft, and then it becomes what's the best player? You know, who's the best player in the other mock? I've considered Derwin James. Broncos fans hated that. Mm -hmm. um, I've reconsidered a little bit uh -huh. on Derwin, given what they have on their depth chart in Denver. And I think Quentin Nelson is the play here. 
Yeah, I like Quentin Nelson. I made no bones about that. He's, in my opinion, the safest pure prospect in this draft, regardless of position. He is going to be good in the NFL. He was amazing in college. I think he's going to be very good in the NFL. So getting a player like that, guard, in my opinion, not that low on the positional value totem pole. It's still a pretty valuable position in today's NFL with guys like Maurice Hurst going before him, putting all that interior pressure, having right. a guy who can stop him, also very important. So I like that pick as well. On to number six. We have the Indianapolis Colts selecting Josh Jackson, cornerback out of Iowa. Yeah, so Josh Jackson had the highest graded season we've given a cornerback last year. Unbelievable ball skills. The Colts want to play a little bit more zone. That's really where Josh Jackson excels at understanding zone concepts because all those Iowa cornerbacks, they're really good at that. So, look, Jackson's the best fit uh, for what they need. They've got one of the worst cornerback depth charts in the entire NFL. They can add spot. They can add any level of defensive player, but Josh Jackson's a great fit for what they do. Yeah, Indianapolis at number six is basically just going to be whoever's the top guy on our board at this point because yeah. there's not a position where they can pass up. Like That roster just it has needs all over the place. So go premium position, go corner, yep. go, go pass rusher if you're them. So I like to pick there at number six. On to number seven, Tampa Bay Buccaneers selecting Florida State safety Derwin James. Derwin James, we call him a safety. I call him a playmaker. He just plays all over the field. Uh, look, Tampa Bay's defense has been known to, you know, for Gerald McCoy, Levante David, maybe Brent Grimes. It's like a handful of playmakers on that defense over these last few years. Add Derwin James now to the mix, and hopefully they're going to use him properly. I want a nice defensive mm -hmm. coordinator that's going to use him at the linebacker level, at the safety level, even at the line of scrimmage, rushing the passer. Derwin James had the top grade of any safety, both his freshman year and his junior year. The only two times he was healthy. Great all-around player and another playmaker for the Bucs. Yeah, love Derwin James. Selfishly, I would love for the Bucs to get some offensive line help for Jameis Winston. But here at number seven, Quentin Nelson off the board already for us. I don't think there's anyone really worthy Trying of that. To match that you, value. You want, yeah, the value just doesn't line up. Address that later in the draft. You can't pass up on Derwin James. I'd be surprised if he fell out of the top ten on actual draft day. Rumor he might, but that number seven is well worth it at that point. On to number eight, Chicago Bears selecting Boston College edge rusher. Harold Landry. So I've given them Quentin Nelson in previous drafts. I went with Nelson a little bit higher. I feel like the Bears are kind of in that situation where the roster is not terrible. You don't want to reach for a need, and you go back to the premium. You, your edge rushers, your cornerbacks. Uh, so I would have considered you know a Denzel Ward here, but our top pass rusher is Harold Landry out of Boston College. We have him a tick above Bradley Chubb. I know you love his three cone. I know you love his bend and a lot of that. Um, that's why he's number one on our edge board, and it's just you know, going back to that edge rusher well for the Bears because they still need it. I edge definitely. Pernell McPhee did not work out. They obviously cut him this offseason. Leonard Floyd has not panned out to that top 10 sort of draft right. type. And we have Landry as grading out well above what Leonard Floyd did in college. LaHero Landry, our top graded, you know, guy in this class from the 2016 season, had, took a little bit of a step back. But he's the top guy on our board at the edge rusher position. We think he's going to be talented in the NFL. So that's a premium position, number eight. I'd be happy if I got that pick for them. Number nine, San Francisco 49ers drafting edge rusher Bradley Chubb out of NC State. Yeah, so Chubb, like we said, a tick below Harold Landry. I, I wrote all about my concerns mm -hmm. with Chubb, but he's still a really good player. Obviously, I'm putting him at nine, but there's yes. a reason why we have Landry a little bit higher. Bradley Chubb is just a solid, good all-around player. Maybe he's going to be similar to what they just got in Solomon Thomas, yeah. but it is one of those deals where they don't have that pure edge rusher on that team. I think Solomon Thomas kicks inside a little bit next year. He takes on guards. Bradley Chubb's at least solid on the outside. Good run defender and good value for them here at nine as they go they go defensive line for the fourth year in a row. Yeah, I this is one of the first pick where I'm like, it just doesn't seem to fit. Sort of like when they picked Solomon Thomas last year. It's yeah. just along that defensive line, the way they play it with uh, you know, the, just how they set up that front. Now they have Buckner, Armstead, Solomon Thomas, and Bradley Chubb all somewhat similar size players. All, all, all three very, ticks, that's all yeah, we're getting. All guys who can play a very similar position. I, I think they need a pure speed guy off that edge. They'd be happier with Landry instead of Chubb, in my opinion, for them. So, I do think Landry's a better fit yeah. for what they want to do, but with him off the board... There just isn't a lot of edge talent to even go around, yep. so if you can get him, yeah, I'd go ahead and do it. On to number 10, Oakland Raiders select Penn State running back Saquon Barkley. Down at number 10? Number this 10. Is, this is the worst mock ever, Mike. Worst How did ever. Barkley go... To number 10, uh, look, it's the positional value thing. I've got our analytics team ready to punch me in the face, even having him in the top 10. Mm -hmm. So I stretched, even just getting him in 10 was a stretch with all the numbers that they're throwing at me about the lack of running back value. But Barkley, I think, is the exception because of what he does as a receiver, 
put him in this Oakland Raiders offense. Uh, John Gruden loved to, to throw to the running back, you know, 20 years ago when he was coaching. So, uh, look, I think he could be a nice fit for the Raiders as they continue to build around Derek Carr. Yeah, realistically, he's probably going to go much earlier come draft day. But I do think running back is a position that Oakland needs to address. Marshawn Lynch was not the answer there for them, is not the answer going forward. I think it's a position that they, they could use someone, and this is a draft to do it, that's just a dynamic sort of threat out of the backfield that can – and get involved in that receiving game there in Oakland with John Gruden, like you mentioned. So big, big picture though, it's you know why did Barkley go this low in our mm -hmm. mind? Because we've got an interior playmaker in Maurice Hurst. We have an outside cornerback in Positional Josh Jackson. Value. It's all of these positions that really impact the passing game more than even the best receiving running back like Barkley, and that's why he drops in our world. Yes. On to number eleven, Miami Dolphins selecting Ohio State cornerback Denzel Ward. I just think the value here is just beautiful. The more we watch Ward, the more we like him. Mm -hmm. And I just love that the NFL is not pigeonholing bad six foot two corners into the first round this year, that they're they're behind a guy like Denzel Ward as yeah. a first round player. And I feel like Miami has needed this guy for a while. And you don't draft for your division necessarily, but when you are trying to beat the New England Patriots, who excel at putting good route runners out there, you need a guy like Ward who's not the six two guy that can't move. This is your sub six foot guy who can match up with a Julian Edelman, who's got unbelievable footwork, ball skills, speed, and quickness. Love the fit for Ward here with the Dolphins. Literally, my only question mark about Ward going into this draft is his size. And at that yeah. point, it's like the Baker Mayfield uh, sort of conversation. If that's all you got, that's if that's the one knock on you, uh, hey, that, that's not a big knock in my world. Like we've seen guys overcome that a lot, and he's not he's not that far off size wise from some of the top cores in the NFL. So I love that fit for them. All right, on to number 12, Buffalo Bills select linebacker Roquan Smith out of Georgia. So you got to understand the reasoning here. I'm the GM. Uh, secretly, I know my own board for all 32 teams, yeah. so I can kind of play the draft a little <laughs> bit, knowing where the quarterbacks are going to go. Uh, obviously, in reality, I think the Bills are looking to move up and go and get their guy. The way I'm looking at this, we set our quarterback board with three first-rounders at the top and then three you know, kind of mid-tier to late first-round guys below that. So I'm kind of playing – the draft a little bit as the Bills. I need a quarterback, but I'm going to go with the best defensive player on the board first in Roquan Smith. The Bills, they're playing that old Carolina Panthers scheme where it's zone heavy, cover two, cover four. You need that chase and run linebacker in the middle of the field. You need that Luke Keekley. That's Roquan Smith in this draft. Yeah, linebacker, that's one of the schemes in the NFL, the way they play zone there. That linebacker, they ask a lot of them in coverage. And a guy like Roquan Smith, you can ask a lot of him in coverage because he's that good at it and can do it all. So from that perspective, love it. Other perspective, like you mentioned, they're going to get a quarterback. They, they didn't trade up as far as they did well, to stay not tuned. get a quarterback. Stay so tuned. We'll see what they end up doing. On to number 13, Washington Redskins get Alabama cornerback Minka Fitzpatrick. So they've got Kendall Fuller, who you know shipped off to Kansas City in the Alex Smith trade. Uh, Minka Fitzpatrick steps right in mm. as that hybrid slot outside corner. Uh, we've, talk, we've talked about this quite a bit. You know What he's able to do in the slot as a run defender as a pass rusher and, of course, in coverage, playing zone, playing man. Minka Fitzpatrick, one of the best, I think, all-around defensive playmakers in this draft. Three solid years at Alabama. Uh, steps right in as a starter for the Redskins. Yeah, and people call the slot cornerback has kind of gotten this connotation of you know being a lesser position over the years. Our data suggests that's not really the case, slot yep. cornerback. Uh, if, you guy, if you have a guy who can man the slot at a very high level, it is as impactful as someone who plays on the outside corner. So... Mick Fitzpatrick, he's not just a slot. I think he can do more than just that. Could even be a safety in some schemes. We had him as a top 10 value for them to get him at 13. I think he might be a guy who falls down some board draft day. Then we get him at 13 would be fantastic yep. for them. On to number 14, Green Bay Packers getting Louisville cornerback Jair Alexander. This was the first part of the draft where I almost, I didn't have to go off our draft board a little bit, but it just wasn't. It wasn't clear. There was, a, there was a lot of offensive linemen who were next up on our board who maybe didn't fit mm -hmm. Green Bay. And, and then we go back to the positional value thing. You know, the, the defensive back position overall for Green Bay has been rough, especially corner the last couple of years. Understatement. Understatement. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it looked like they had this influx of youth and it yeah. just hasn't panned out, right? So they have to go back to the well. Uh, Jair Alexander, the more we watched him, the more we liked him. His 2016 grade was, was unbelievable. 2017, he battled injury. But another smaller corner who just has the movement skills to play inside, play outside. Coverage ability is just so valuable in the NFL. I think Alexander's a great fit. It would be interesting to see where Green Bay does go in this draft because we like guys like Denzel Ward, Jay Alexander, who are undersized. Green Bay, historically, 
has not drafted underside corners. They won't take right. a guy who's you know sub five eleven. So if he's there, they could also though you know go to the sort of with Mike Pettin, they could be changing those standards and being able to play more matchups with Kevin King on one side being a longer you know six two plus corner who can match up with a taller receiver, Jair Alexander, shorter, quicker, shiftier guy could match up with the shorter, quicker, shifter wide receiver, that would make sense in my opinion, but right. teams have high cutoffs for a reason. That was the Patriots did it a couple years ago when they won the Super Bowl. They had Brandon Browner as that big mauling outside corner against the big receivers. Darrell Revis covered the better route runners. I'm all about cornerback versatility mm -hmm. and having guys that can do different things in that defensive backfield. One thing's for sure, though, they need help anywhere along that defense probably, yep. so that's a good fit. On to number 15, Arizona Cardinals select quarterback Lamar Jackson out of Louisville. All right, so Lamar is a guy we've debated back and forth. You said you didn't even want to rank him. You just wanted to have his own I didn't own want to rank section. him. Yeah, he was his own entity in the quarterback group. So much depends on how the team uses him. I, I, I keep using the phrase, there's a path to success in the NFL for Lamar Jackson. I wrote all about it. It's on profootballfocus.com. So I'm assuming the Arizona Cardinals will play to his skill set, which is uh, can make big NFL throws. He's going to miss a few throws, but he have to use his athleticism. Uh, you know, Buffalo, it might be a little high for him, you know, maybe at 15, mm -hmm. but it's one of those things where if you Arizona. need a quarterback, if, if I was Buffalo at 12, if they didn't have that second pick, mm -hmm. I probably would have taken Lamar there. If yeah. you need a quarterback, you do have to take some chances. Arizona clearly needs a quarterback. Lamar up to, upgrades that athleticism a little bit in that quarterback room <laughs> with Sam Bradford and Mike Glennon in there. I was so. going to say, you don't think uh, Glennon's the future there or Bradford's I don't, the future? I don't think they are. I okay. think that's a big, wide, slow mm -hmm. bridge Fair to enough. Lamar Jackson. And I do think Lamar could still use some seasoning in terms of yeah. if he goes to a place where he can sit for a couple of years, that might be his best bet in terms of long-term success. The one other thing working for him... He has improved every year, and he came out of high school without even using a playbook. So he's still relatively young at the mm -hmm. general quarterback position when it comes to running plays and yeah. having a playbook. All right, on to number 16, Baltimore Ravens. We had them selecting Arkansas center Frank Ragno. So this is where the interior offensive line value on our board just becomes really strong. Ragnow's a borderline top 10 player mm -hmm. in, in our world because uh, he was the number one graded center the last two years. He's so strong in pass protection. He can make all the blocks in the running game. Uh, the Baltimore Ravens have continued to really make that offensive line better and better every year. I think this one takes it to the next level. Ryan Jensen's moving on at center. Ragnow steps right in. It's not the sexy pick that the Ravens want. I know they want a wide receiver here, but the receiver depth in this draft is really good in rounds two and three. They can get Ragnow here and then grab that receiver in rounds two or three. The thing I love about Ragnow, besides just him being you know, off the charts great in these past couple years, he played center at Arkansas the past two years, filled in one game at right guard this past season against Alabama defensive line, his second highest graded game of the year. He was yeah. a monster against just switching positions on the fly, that sort of versatility, you can't really put a price tag on it. And so he could fill in anywhere for the Ravens, and they, you know, we saw how last year they needed guys to fill in basically everywhere. Yeah. So. On to number 17, Los Angeles Chargers select Mike McGlinchey, offensive tackle out of Notre Dame. So I love how much work the Chargers put into the offensive line last year. We saw it a little bit on the field, but you know, a guy like Forrest Lamp coming back from injury. Now you have McGlinchey where the tackle position is still weak there. You have Russell Okung at left tackle, Joe Barksdale at right tackle. I think McGlinchey could step right in at right tackle, which he played at Notre Dame his sophomore year and was one of the highest graded tackles in the nation doing that. Moves to left tackle his last two years, one of the highest graded tackles there. Uh, mauling run blocker, has all the tools to be a good pass protector, though there are some question marks about that part of his game. But I just love the Chargers continuing to revamp that O-line. Yeah, Chargers, uh, I think everyone sort of has them penciled in for maybe D-line getting help there. But they, like you said, they could use help along the offensive line as well. And the value here fits in terms of where we have McGlinchey on our board and where he ends up getting selected. So I think Chargers could go a number of ways. I wouldn't just pencil them into one single uh, you know, defensive lineman in this class. So on to number 18, Seattle Seahawks. We have them selecting Georgia guard slash tackle Isaiah Wynn. The Seahawks have just become a team that really does have holes all around their roster. So yes. it's not as simple as like, hey, just go get offensive linemen. But I do think Isaiah Wynn, he's one of those guys who was so good at tackle in college but he has a guard body, mm -hmm. but I'd still like to see them try him at tackle. You know, so Dwayne Brown was solid at yeah. left tackle. If you can move Jermaine Effetti back into guard and maybe give Wynn a chance to play some right tackle, and then if that fails, hey, he's a really good guard. He is an unbelievable, just all-around run blocker, smooth pass protector, 
Love the fit for Wynn with some positional versatility. Yeah, would love for the Seahawks now that they have a new offensive line coach to actually start drafting good offensive linemen out of college instead of projects right. that might end up being good offensive and linemen. And Wynn is good. Isaiah Wynn, is Wynn good. qualifies as yes. a very good top-graded offensive lineman from the SEC a season ago. On to number 19, Dallas Cowboys select wide receiver Calvin Ridley out of Alabama. First wide receiver off the board. First wide receiver off the board because it does feel like this wide receiver class, it's a whole bunch of number twos. Uh, but what Ridley does well, the best thing he does is route running, getting open. He doesn't catch the ball that well, but he's an explosive route runner, gets open. We know Des Bryant's moving on. Uh, sounds easy, sounds simple, but Dak Prescott just needs guys that get open. When he gets guys that are open, he's one of the best quarterbacks in the league. Ridley's the perfect fit for that. That's very true because he's not much of a – he doesn't throw into a lot of contested situations. He is a guy who needs to see a guy open to get it to him. Calvin Ridley – like you said, gets open more better than anyone else in this class. He has the best route runner in this class. So from that sense, I think it makes a lot of sense. And then from the other sense of they really have no wide receivers, it right. also makes a lot of sense. So need and value matches. Need up value well matches up very well there. On to number twenty, Detroit Lions select Washington defensive tackle Vita Vey. So this is one Vey has gone to Dallas in previous mocks for me. So I passed up on him to get Ridley in part because of the Des Bryant deal. Vey is a nice fit for Detroit. Uh, you know, the big question mark with him is can he rush the passer at the next level? So at the very least, you're getting a very good run defender, 340-pound nose tackle that, that Detroit just needs in the middle of that defense. But I do think he'll push the pocket pretty well. You have Matt Patricia in there. So they're going to think, hey, we've got our Vince Wilfork, our old, you know, big body in the middle of that D. Yeah, that defense definitely needs someone on the interior. Uh, they were incredibly weak there a season ago. And it just... Vita Vey, I, I do think he can push the pocket. I know the questions about him. The thing I'm more worried about is can he stay on the field for 600, 700 snaps right. a season and maintain that level of play? Because at 340 plus pounds, it's just difficult to do. Not a lot of guys can do it. And the fact is, he's never done it before. He never did it in college. He played 60% of their snaps this past season. And that was the most he ever played at Washington, which is, that's the concerning part yeah. to me. So, in terms of on the field questions, not a lot with him. He's a talented player. So if you can get him to play every snap, it's going to be a steal at 20. So on to 21, Cincinnati Bengals select Texas offensive tackle Connor Williams. So the Bengals would love Ragnow, I think, at this point. They would love McGlinchey to fall. Uh, Colton Miller, the UCLA offensive tackle, has gotten a lot of first-round hype that we just don't necessarily believe in him as a first-rounder. Uh, we do believe in Connor Williams, though. And I know a lot of the NFL believes he might be a guard. That's fine. If he lands a guard, he's still a very, very good player. He's another guy that deserves a shot at tackle. They brought in Cordy Glenn to be the left tackle. Jake Fisher still a major question mark at right tackle. So I think you grab Connor Williams, try to see if he can handle right tackle. If at worst you have a very good guard, it's still a good pick. Now, Bengals, I don't usually advocate drafting for need, but when you look at that offensive line and you look at the rest of the roster, it's like, it's like, how can you not at that point? It's just yeah. so far and away a weak spot on that team. We saw how much it affected them last year. And the thing is, you can go, it's not just need, there's anywhere along that offensive line you can address. And so we think there will be value there in terms right. of who's on the board. And so Connor Williams definitely fits that bill. He could play right tackle. He could play inside at guard. So I like that pick for them. On to 22, Buffalo Bills select Mason Rudolph, quarterback out of Oklahoma State. All right, so we don't have Josh Allen off the board yet. No, if you guys Allen. have been following us, you know we think we see Josh Allen maybe as a borderline first or second round type of uh, actual player. Understand the upside, but he might not. We'll see if he ends up in this first round later on. Mason Rudolph's the next guy off the board. Uh, he's got three years of good production at Oklahoma State. Can make throws outside the numbers. Doesn't have that cannon for an arm, but he just does so things, so many things well at the intermediate and the deep level. Has to shore up some of his short area accuracy. If you're the Bills, you have those two picks, and you can't get one of those top guys, it's worth at least taking the shot on Rudolph, even if he's not as clean of a prospect as those top three or four. Yeah, if Mayfield's off the board early, if Rosen, Darnold, if the, if the Bills can't go up and get one of those three guys on the GM for the Bills, I stand pat. I'm going to keep my two first-round picks because yep. one of Rudolph or Lamar Jackson is likely going to be there for you. I'm not going up and trying to nab Josh Allen at the top of the draft when one of those guys will be staring me in the face because I don't, like we mentioned, we think they're better players, Rudolph and Jackson, than Allen is. And even realistically, I don't just foresee Josh Allen uh, being worth it. It's just, I don't see the upside there. The, the upside that everyone oh, says. Mike. It's just not there yeah. with him. So I, I think you stand pat. The fact that you can grab two guys then with those two picks instead of having to trade them up for one is also a huge, you know, uh, sort of factor in that decision. So 
Yeah, I like if the Mace, if this draft fell this way for the Bills, I would be very happy. If getting right. Roquan and then Mason Rudolph, that would be a great draft for me in the first round. Yeah, and even if Rudolph isn't as flashy of a prospect as those top guys, mm -hmm. it's really not a detrimental mistake to take a quarterback in the first round. We've seen the the Denver Broncos missed on Paxton Lynch two years ago. They're they're picking at number five this year. They have a chance to rectify that two yes. years later. Uh, you have to keep swinging when it comes to the quarterback position. And, and Rudolph is, is the safest choice here at number 22. All right, on to number tw 23, the New England Patriots select Dallas Goddard, tight end out of South Dakota State. So even w without the Gronk rumors, yeah. and I know you don't like tight ends in the first round, I, I am just intrigued by Goddard's playmaking ability at 6'5", 255, runs routes like a wide receiver. He looks like a wide receiver after the catch. I know it's against FCS competition at South Dakota State, but just such a good playmaker and the Patriots have been trying to build this two tight end system for a while now. It was Gronk plus, you know, a, a Scott Chandler. It was Gronk plus Martellus Bennett. Gronk plus Dwayne Allen. They're always trying to get that number two playmaker there. Mm. And at worst, when Gronk gets hurt, which is, seems inevitable, Goddard steps right in. So now you've got another playmaker for Tom Brady for the next 10 years. Yeah, I don't hate it, obviously. I, I think there could be other positions, especially along the defensive side of the ball, that could be addressed by them. Definitely but consider that, yeah. Dallas Goddard, I, he's probably he's our top tight end in the draft. I like him a lot. I like his average catch ability. I do worry about the competitional aspect, yep. making that jump, and I'm not sure he's a – a lot of teams, even the Patriots, like their number two tight end to be able to run block at a high level. I'm not sure he's that just right. yet. He could be in time. He has the skills to, but I'm not sure he's that just yet. So – Maybe one of the first picks that I'm like, eh, maybe, maybe. I, I made it this far without you questioning me. That's good. I was thinking about, you know, your approval every time I made a mm. pick. So. Well, you should be. On to number 24, the Carolina Panthers select Will Hernandez, guard out of UTEP. Is there a better fit in this entire draft for player and team? It's perfect. That's, so power he's basically scheme. Trey Turner, but flip sides. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're going to have these two guards that are unbelievable at pulling, destroying people at the line of scrimmage. North Turner's in there. They're going to stick with that power-heavy scheme. And uh, Hernandez is just such a mauler in the run game. He has the top grade we've ever given to a guard in a, in a regular season. Just edged out Quentin Nelson, his mm -hmm. 2016 season. Um, only given up four pressures over the last couple of years. Hernandez is just such a good prospect and a great fit for the Panthers. Yeah, the fit makes so much sense. And Will Hernandez is probably my favorite eval in this draft because it's just so evident who he is. He is yep. just a people mover. He's just a monster. He's just stronger than pretty much everyone he goes up against and is has the enough athleticism to uh, where it's not really going to be, you know, it's not going to be an issue in pass protection. He's not going to be a liability anywhere. At that point, with, from what the Carolina Panthers want to do in the running game, that's a perfect fit. So yep. I like it. On to 25, Tennessee Titans draft Marcus Davenport, UTSA edge defender. So I like this fit because you've got Brian Arakpo there, you have Derek Morgan, both guys who have just just stuck around year after year as yeah. you know, solid edge defenders. They've been looking to the future there in Tennessee with Kevin Dodd a couple years ago. We didn't love that pick. I think Davenport get, comes into a great situation where he has a little bit of time to ease his way in behind Arakpo and Morgan, eventually take over. Very productive, 6'6 six, six plus, knows how to push the pocket, just needs a little bit of polish, and I think this is the place to uh, to get that. It's actually interesting that he goes there because he's sort of, Brian Arakpo would be, or his you know upshoot, if he ever puts it all together, that would be a guy yeah. who, his play style is very similar. So uh, I do like him from that perspective. I'm not sure there's necessarily, it's necessarily a huge fit because like you mentioned, Derek Morgan and Arakpo, both quality players, they are both aging, so... From the perspective of Davenport, I don't think he's ready to play right away. I don't think he's ready to step in and be an impact player. But two years down the line, three years down the line, he could be. And that's probably when they'll need that help at edge defender. So they're in a position that I, I don't hate the pick, but uh, you know my feelings on Mark Davenport. Thanks for not hating. You see him <laughs> more as an early second type Yeah, more player. as an early second type player. If he's, the thing is, if he's my number one overall pick, I just don't think he's making an impact year one. And right. I think you want your first guy to at least be able to make that impact year one. You're a millennial, all about that instant impact. <laughs> I have no no. Please don't there. trash me. I'm just, it's a joke, guys. It's a joke. All right, on to number 26, the Atlanta Falcons select wide receiver James Washington out of Oklahoma State. Yeah, so with Taylor Gabriel moving on, you still have Muhammad Sanu on the roster. Of course, you have Julio Jones. That Falcons offense was at, his be as, at its best two years ago when you have this variety of playmakers. I think Washington's a really nice complement to Julio Jones. He knows how to get open, explosive in and out of his routes, adds a little bit of a deep threat. Uh, we've had a lot of debates internally about James Washington versus Calvin Ridley versus a couple of other 
wide receivers. I think this is just a nice fit to complement Julio Jones. And even if it's not Washington, there's a couple other receivers that are really good complements to the number one that's Julio. I'll just say, I, I if I'm the Falcons, I, I can see drafting wide receiver, but if I'm going to take a guy, I'm going to take DJ Moore at this point, the wide receiver out of Maryland, because of what he can do complementary. I don't think they have a, a yards after the catch sort of guy. I don't think they have a guy that they can throw screens to on that roster right now and really, you know, like make plays out of it. He would be a Gabriel. DJ type Moore of would player. be perfect in terms of he can do the underneath stuff at extremely high level, and then you have Julio Jones doing the you know the downfield stuff. You have Sanu manning the slot and doing those sort of things. So I think complementary wise, I'd just rather see DJ Moore. And I, as talent wise, I think him and Washington are very similar. No, that'd be a good fit. I'd be fine with that. Okay, well, we'll change the. Picture. I should change it. All right. Uh oh. <laughs> On to number twenty-seven. New Orleans Saints select linebacker Leighton Vander Esch out of Boise State. Well, so the Saints have just made great strides on defense the last couple of years. Uh, linebacker, still an issue. Mm -hmm. Van Der Esch has three down ability. Outstanding against the run, which matters a, a little bit still. Mm -hmm. uh, flies around the, the, the field in the run game, and he's got some good range in coverage, and I think it's just another added piece on that defense. Yeah, the linebackers, uh, not really a premium position in the NFL, but they're so bad there that it's worth addressing. With a three down linebacker, uh, yeah. I still think is in that premium. Yell at me, analytics team, if you need to, but <laughs> the three down linebacker that can play in coverage, I do think is extremely valuable. And again, I don't advocate always drafting for need, but when you're a roster that's close to competing for a championship and the need is that great, I think uh, like you're making strides in year one with the sort of upgrade he can bring to your roster that could bring you a championship. And so at that yep. point, I'm fine with it. All right, on to number 28, Pittsburgh Steelers take linebacker Tremaine Edmonds out of Virginia Tech. Another one that fits a need, we know Ryan Shazier dealing with uh, you know, his terrible injury. Yeah. And, and even when he was on the field, it, they, they still kind of needed a Another nice athletic compliment yeah. to him. So the linebacker position was going to be a big need for Pittsburgh, and I think the value matches up here with Tremaine Edmonds. I know Edmonds is getting top ten yeah, height. Realistically. He's, not a yeah. he's just not as clean of a prospect as, say, a Roquan Smith mm -hmm. at the top of the draft. So on our board... He's one of those guys we like, don't love. He's a late first-round player on our board, so it just matches up here that we would go Edmonds and Pittsburgh. I know it looks like a steal based off of hearsay and all that stuff, mm. but it's just a good fit, not a not a steal, I don't think, in our mind. Yeah, it really tells, well, which basically our thoughts on Edmonds is that he's far from a clean prospect coming out. He has right. this, he's this incredibly freaky athlete, but has yet to put that into an incredibly freaky football player. He's right. just a, an athlete playing football at this point, not the other way around. You hope that in time he does it. And at the linebacker position, I just worry about taking that highly because, again, like I've said, not really a premium position to where if you're taking a guy who is going to need to take a while to develop, I'd rather address somewhere else in the draft early. So that's why we have him there at 28. On to 29, Jacksonville Jaguars select wide receiver DJ Moore out of Maryland. So there's DJ Moore for you. I had been putting Cortland Sutton in this spot for, for the Jaguars. I mixed it up a little bit with Moore. Again, I, I feel like a lot of these receivers are interchangeable as far as value, even though they do things stylistically differently. You mentioned Moore's skills a couple minutes ago. After the catch, so good at getting up the field. So he's this versatile weapon, can be a bit of a deep threat, just really good athlete after the catch threat to add to that Jags wide receiver core. Yeah, I think they definitely need all the help they can get offensively. I I'm not sure, though, it's really going to necessarily make that offense that much better if Blake Bortles is still at the home. I, I, I just don't know. There's still Leonard Fournette. There's, there's still Leonard Fournette, and they did add Andrew Norwell this offseason at guard. But selfishly, I'm, when you are that have this dominant of a defense, I almost want to just keep – See how see how high we can take this, and I, I think if you could, they Just got keep someone throwing corners at it. Yeah, if they got someone like Mike Hughes uh, out of UCF, the slot cornerback, that would just like he could perfectly play, you know replace uh, Colvin there in the slot, and that defense could get you know just impenetrable overnight. Still, and that's all I want to say. Still should have drafted Marshawn Lattimore. Exactly. Last year. Oh, exactly. All right, on to the thirtieth overall pick, Minnesota Vikings select. Taven Bryan, defensive tackle out of Florida. So I think need and value match well here as well. Taven Bryan, he's that next you know, penetrating three-tech in this draft. You've got Maurice Hurst and then a big gap. Yes. And I think Taven Bryan's kind of that next guy. And there's a big gap after him as well. So uh, they already added Sheldon Richardson, but I think Bryan just adds to that depth. Minnesota's one of those teams, again, doesn't have other than the offensive line. And look, the, the offensive line value here is a little questionable. It just doesn't match up perfectly. I do think there's good second and third round value where they can go get their offensive linemen. But you have to kind of maintain that level of excellence that the defense has had. You can't ignore that defense just because the O-line mm -hmm. is, uh, is bad right now. 
Taven Bryan, I think, is a good fit and a guy that's going to step in. You know, Sharif Floyd's moving on. You know, they need those interior penetrators. And the Vikings is a team where it's kind of hard to pinpoint a need where it's like, oh, yeah, we got to go address this in the draft. Right. There just really isn't many. It's a pretty stacked roster. So that's when you can start getting greedy, start getting, you know, premium positions that guys could, you know, uh, impact down the road. And Taven Bryan, you always need more pass rushers, and I think he can provide that. So on to the 31st overall pick, New England Patriots select Mike Hughes, cornerback out of UCF. Yeah, so here's your boy Hughes. Uh, he could play the slot. He could play outside. He's good in off coverage. He could press a little bit. Movement skills are just fantastic. When you look at the way the Patriots construct their cornerback depth chart, Stephon Gilmore is the big guy that handles the big receivers. They just lost Malcolm Butler, who generally handled the better route runner. Hughes can eventually move into that role. Of course, they bring in Jason McCourty as well, and it just brings a lot of versatility to this man coverage secondary that likes to play like, like it's matchup basketball. You're going to take him. You're going to take him. Hughes adds, adds a different playing style to what they have, and it's a good value here late first. Yeah, Hughes, uh, he is an undersized corner, like you mentioned. That would be That could replace... Malcolm Butler, and he's an undersized corner, though, can still play man coverage. Yeah. And they love to play man coverage there in New England. He is incredibly physical, and even in press coverage. So that, that fit seems perfect in terms of stylistically what they need as well. So on to the 32nd overall pick, last pick in the first round here, Philadelphia Eagles select cornerback Dante Jackson out of LSU. So another roster that doesn't have major holes, mm -hmm. and when the team doesn't have major holes, I think you go back to the positional value well. You grab your coverage players, you grab your pass rushers, you grab uh, you know, guys that can impact the pass game. If there is a need, though, if there is a question mark, it's at slot corner, and we talked about it earlier, slot corner is of immense value in the NFL, mm -hmm. one of the reasons why the Eagles were so good last year. Patrick yeah. Robinson has a career year covering the slot, so they're going to take Dante Jackson, who can step in and cover the slot. The Eagles have a bunch of guys who are best fit playing on the outside, whether it's Ronald Darby, uh, Mills, whether it's uh, you know Sidney Jones coming mm -hmm. off of injury, Rasul Douglas, all these big long corners on the outside, put Jackson in the slot and just kind of replace what you lost with Patrick Robinson. Yeah, I think they definitely do need someone there on the slot. And Jackson, his speed, is that jumped off tape like no one's speed I saw in this draft. He just flies as soon as he wants to crank it up to full speed. And he's a guy who... I'm not sure can ever hold up on the outside. He's just very slightly built. He's very undersized for right. an outside cornerback. But what he can do in the slot, what he can do closing on balls with that speed is, like we mentioned, still a very worthwhile position, still a very valuable position in the NFL. So if they can grab someone like that at 32, they could have year one impacts and keep them in the uh, Super Bowl mix. Late first, a lot of cornerbacks, I think, are yeah. going to sneak in there. So that's the mock. We've done a little something different this time around. I didn't write up all the picks. I want you guys to get all the analysis from us through this video. So I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Leave your comments below, of course. Don't tell me this is the worst mock draft ever. It's the best mock draft you've ever seen. It's exactly what I would do as GM. It's not a prediction of the future, so make sure you guys understand that. Is that, is that about it, Mike? Did that's about that? it. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Make sure to go check out the PFF Draft Guide on pff.com. Join the... Profootballfocus.com.